uh, good uh, afternoon or possibly evening <clears throat> to all of you who are joining us uh, for this uh, seminar of the Arab Reform and Democracy Program. <clears throat> it's our great honor to be hosting uh, one of the leading scholars of uh, Lebanon, uh, Ziad Abu Rish from Ohio University, uh, but coming to us from Beirut now uh, to talk about uh, uh, political mobilization and protest in a time of crisis in Lebanon. Uh, I have always found Lebanon to be uh, one of the most politically socially complex and influential countries in the Arab world and often uh, a very important um, source of influence for the rest of the region, uh, not least in uh, the articulation of aspirations for a democratic voice. Uh, uh, Ziad, we're immensely grateful to you uh, for your sharing your time and knowledge with us. And I'm gonna now hand it over to uh, my colleague, uh, Hisham Salam. Thank you, Larry, and welcome everyone to uh, the quarantine of the program in Arab Reform and Democracy at uh, the Center on Democracy Development and the Rule of Law at Stanford. Face masks optional, as you can see. Uh, I'm very pleased that uh, our intellectual exchanges continue to endure the uh, shelter in place conditions and continue to benefit from the wide engagements of colleagues and partners uh, that are scattered throughout the US, Europe, the Middle East, and uh, Australia. Uh, today, I'm very pleased to welcome our speaker, Ziad Aburish, whose presentation is titled Lebanon's Uprising in a Time of Crises. Ziad uh, is an assistant professor of history at Ohio University. His research explores state formation, economic development, and popular mobilizations in the Middle East, with a particular focus on Lebanon and Jordan. Uh, while his long-term uh, research focuses on Lebanon during the 1940s and 1950s, uh, his writings uh, and contributions have also engaged closely with the contemporary developments in Lebanese uh, politics. Ziad is co-editor of The Dawn of the Arab Uprisings and of an Old Order, published in 2012. He currently serves as a senior editor at the Arab Studies Journal, uh, and he's a fellow co-editor at Jadareya and a board member of the Lebanese Studies Association. He is also a research fellow at uh, the Lebanese Center for Policy Studies. He holds a PhD in history from UCLA and uh, an MA in Arab Studies from Georgetown University where we actually graduated the same class, class of 2006. Uh, with that, I will hand it over to you, Ziad. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hisham and uh, Larry for uh, the very kind introduction and uh, the invitation to speak with you colleagues and friends uh, at Stanford and elsewhere. I, I'd like to start with just two quick uh, caveats. Uh, the first caveat is that um, what I will do today is to provide a framework uh, to understand and make sense of the current moment, uh, big picture in Lebanon. The situation is in flux and uh, ma many variables are yet unknown and will probably unfold in the coming weeks. Uh, and what I would like to do, rather than focus on very specific events, is provide a framework that can make sense of where we are and how to incorporate future events. I also want to say that while I speak with a very critical uh, sense towards the status quo in Lebanon and in support of the aspirations for more transparent, accountable, and just uh, political system and economic system in Lebanon, I should be clear that I do not speak for the many voices of people who have risen up here in Lebanon. In fact, there's an extremely vibrant debate uh, within uh, the camp that we could call the uprising, uh, uh, the critical uh, uh, citizens and, and the people who have sacrificed much uh, for a better future and to challenge the status quo today. And I hope that in the Q&A, I might be able to highlight some of the English language sources because I presume that the majority of the audience here today is, is a majority English language uh, uh, audience. So today's presentation is going to unfold in three parts. In the first part, uh, I would like to introduce what I think of as the multiple crises manifesting in Lebanon today um, and the context for these crises. In the second part of the presentation, I want to take stock of the uprising that unfolded beginning in October 17, 2019, and where it stood uh, by 
the time the COVID-19 pandemic uh, unfolded here in Lebanon and globally. And then finally, I would like to pick up on the issue of the COVID-19 pandemic to give you an update of where things stand with regards to the pandemic in Lebanon, but circle back to how the pandemic intersects with the uprising and the broader set of crises that we've talked about. So in terms of the first part of the presentation, taking stock and understanding the current moment, I think it's really important to understand that Lebanon today is defined by a set of overlapping crises. And for the purposes of the presentation, I'd like to list five crises. I'm going to briefly summarize each of them. And of course, there could be many articles and books written about each of them. And in fact, there are very vibrant and intense debates occurring to make sense of each of those crises and their relation to one another. But I think a starting point for understanding what's happening in Lebanon is understanding these four crises. The first crisis we have is a financial crisis. And this is perhaps the crisis that's receiving the most attention in the news. Uh, regionally and internationally. The basic gist of this crisis is that there is a shortage of dollars. Uh, the value of the currency is plummeting. It has now lost about 60% of its value vis-a-vis -vis the dollar. There is a shortage of foreign currency to sustain uh, not just luxury imports, but also important uh, imports and that the citizens and residents of Lebanon are currently facing uh, ad hoc capital controls by the banking sector on their dollar deposits, making it very difficult for people to access cash at its current value. The second crisis that we could talk about in Lebanon is a fiscal crisis and the chronic deficit that the state budget has run. Simply put, expenses have far out paced revenues on an annual basis in Lebanon. Now, it's popular to usually attribute this deficit to the quote unquote problem of salaries and pensions for the public sector, something I'm very critical of. Uh, but I think two other important elements and perhaps more important in my view is the regressive taxation and the burden of public debt, which currently stands today at about 90 billion US dollars. Um, that's about 160% of Lebanon's GDP. Just to give you a sense of where that debt stands in relation to overall expenses, and for those of you not interested in economics or political economy, I'll try not to make your eyes roll back too far, although I think if anything, the crises in Lebanon have demonstrated the necessity of understanding political economy here and elsewhere. Between 1993 and 2019, overall state expenditure totaled $236 billion. 84 billion of that $236 billion was at debt servicing. So this gives you a sense of the amount that is being uh, siphoned off. Nearly about a third of annual expenditures at this point goes towards debt servicing, something that far outpaces salaries and far outpaces the different kinds of subsidies that most people tend to try and critique and talk about. I'd also like to point to the third um, or I should go like this so that you can actually see the fingers, uh, crisis in Lebanon, and that is a developmental crisis. Now, we can think of this developmental crisis in two ways. On the one hand, uh, economic growth has stagnated. Uh, the idea of revenue generation has come to a standstill for a variety of reasons. But perhaps more important, the distribution of uh, revenue generation, the distribution of growth, the distribution of national income uh, is such that we are witnessing uh, long before the uprising in the COVID-19 pandemic, increasing rates of poverty, increasing rates of unemployment, increasing rates of underemployment, and uh, decreasing purchasing power. In fact, according to one estimate, 55% of the national income goes to the top 10% of earners in Lebanon, just to show you how unequal income generation is. And of course, we can talk about how that's related to um, the fiscal crisis and uh, the previous crises that I discussed. 
A fourth crisis is probably one that many of you who have visited Lebanon are very familiar with, and that is the infrastructural crisis. Whether we talk about electricity, water, waste management, or transportation in the sense of roads, bridges, but also public transportation, we have dilapidated infrastructure in Lebanon, uh, infrastructure that has not properly addressed the needs of the population. And in fact, most people end up paying two electricity bills two water bills, one to the state utility companies and one to private companies to make up for the shortage. And we can definitely talk about how this infrastructural crisis relates to the developmental crises, uh, the financial crises, and the fiscal crises. Now, finally, the fifth crisis is uh, a political crisis. And uh, of course, a political crisis can mean many things to many people, but what I mean here is that the efficacy of the electoral system in Lebanon is severely uh, under strain and has raised major questions. Simply put, electoral politics has failed to bring about any reasonable response to the needs and aspirations of the majority of the population of Lebanon, both Lebanese citizens and, uh, for that matter, non-Lebanese citizens, a group of the population I will be talking about later on. A part of this political crisis is also that the hegemony or dominance of the major political parties, irrespective of their international alliances and irrespective of their internal struggles, uh, has seen severe cracks, uh, which I think uh, the uprising and previous periods of mass mobilization, such as the 2015 garbage crisis and the 2016 municipal elections, speaks to. And finally, uh, various political factions in Lebanon have entered into a zero-sum game with one another. Uh, the only exception to this zero-sum game between the various rivaling political groups in Lebanon is when they face an external threat like the uprising. In that sense, they tend to circle the wagon, so to speak, and provide a united front. Now, why do I speak about these five crises to start with? It's because I think that there are multiple dynamics at play in Lebanon, and depending on which ones we want to focus on, we might have very different conversations. And my goal is not to try and provide a totalizing analysis of these crises, but to just lay them out so we understand that they exist and that they are occurring, and through the rest of the presentation, highlight how they are intersecting with the uprising, with the COVID-19 pandemic, and perhaps in the Q&A, we could talk more about each of these crises. I do, before I shift gears to the second part of the presentation, simply point to the fact that these crises are not necessarily the result of external machinations, whether it's the regional instability or shifts in the global economy or political order. These are very important context variables uh, that affect daily life and broader structures and institutions in Lebanon. But I think it's really important to understand, and this is something that protesters in Lebanon and many of the critical scholars and activists and journalists have pointed to, that these multiple crises are symptomatic of what we could call the post-war order in Lebanon. And by the post-war order, I mean the political system that exists in Lebanon that was put in place at the end of the civil war and continues until today, as well as the economic system that has been put in place in Lebanon. Um, it's really important to understand that. Uh, I'm happy to go into that in the Q&A, but I didn't want to make this presentation about the post-war order, so I'm not going to dwell on this. But I personally am very critical of the idea that it's about 2011, or it's simply about uh, the drying up of international remittances, there are structural features to the political system and the economic system in Lebanon that were put in place as part of the post-war settlement, the roots of which uh, uh, I think can help us understand these crises. And if we had listened to some of the scholars, some of the activists, and some of the journalists who had sounded alarm several years earlier about each of these crises, we might have been able to see a different path taken. So now what I'd like to do is move on to the second aspect of today's presentation, and that is to talk briefly about the protest movement uh, or uprising or revolution, depending on your term uh, and perhaps even your politics. 
Uh, and I'm here talking about the mass mobilizations that erupted on October 17th, 2019, captured the imagination of the overwhelming majority of the population in Lebanon, even those that might have been critical of the uprising slash revolution. Um, we know that the October Revolution, as it has come to be called by many of its partisans, was initially sparked by the idea of uh, adding a tax to um, WhatsApp and other uh, voice internet uh, applications, which also speaks to the question of regressive taxation and the developmental model and uh, uh, the fiscal crisis of the state, and that it started in Beirut. But what's really important to understand is within a few days, um, the uprising had basically engulfed uh, large parts of the country and that the grievances that were aired and the demands that were made went far beyond the WhatsApp tax and in fact used the WhatsApp tax as a minor example of a much broader set of problems that the population and participants in the protests were facing. Now, I want to be clear that the uprising slash revolution was not equal in intensity or timing or geography, uh, and that we would have to look at different places at different times with different communities to try and understand how the uprising unfolded in different parts of Beirut, in North Lebanon, South Lebanon, the Bekaa, uh, uh, Mount Lebanon, uh, urban areas versus rural areas. Uh, uh, mixed sectarian communities, working class neighborhoods versus upper class neighborhoods. But I think it's important to understand that most people experience the uprising as a singular event. Whether they were for the uprising or against the uprising, there was this phenomenon that everyone started to experience and interact with known as the revolution. Um, whether one supported it or not. But it is important to understand that at one point, estimates placed about 2 million people in the streets of Lebanon. Now, overall population in Lebanon is about 6 million. Uh, so that gives you a sense. Imagine if you're in the United States, if one out of every three people around you had turned out into the streets one day. That's quite the massive uh, turnout. Even if it happened for one day, I think it is indicative of the kind of frustrations that exist in Lebanon. Now, irrespective of one, what one might say about the uneven terrain of the uprising geographically in terms of social basis uh, or in terms of timing, I think it's an, an important to understand that it created a broad enough umbrella that brought together a diversity of individuals and groups that on the one hand built on previous experiences of mass mobilization, particularly the 2015 garbage crisis and the 2016 municipal elections, but also innovated new tactics, brought in new constituencies and saw the emergence of new leaders. And I think that's very important to underscore. In response to this massive uprising, I think it's important to acknowledge the fact that the state deployed a variety of tactics primarily premised on violence and repression towards the protesters. This violence and repression uh, took place in three modalities. The first was the deployment of security forces and the army to either contain the movement of protesters or to actually confront them and disperse them violently. I think it's also important to understand that there was a campaign of legal prosecution against a variety of protesters, whether they acted in nonviolent ways or in what others would call violent ways, and that that prosecution in many cases took the form of military tribunals rather than civilian courts to circumscribe the ability of these people to get adequate legal attention and adequate civil rights protection and due process in those prosecutions. And finally, of course, we heard a lot about the uh, thugs, the Baltajie, uh, uh, the Zoran, whatever term you want to use, uh, uh, civilian clothed persons who had attacked protesters, uh, presumably under the command or with the green light of the uh, leadership of certain political parties but the reason I bring this under the rubric of state violence is that in many cases, this type of thuggish violence against protesters took place in front of security forces, in front of military personnel that refused 
in most cases to intervene to protect protesters and that we did not see the same kind of prosecution of these uh, individuals and these groups towards the protesters as we saw of the protesters themselves. Now, I think it's important to recognize that the uprising was significant and effective enough to cause the country to come to a complete standstill. In fact, one of the most effective tools that we saw in the October 17th revolution is that no business as usual actually meant no business as usual. Most of the country came to a standstill, either as a result of formal and informal strikes and boycotts, road closures, or uh, uh, businesses and workplaces themselves selecting to close up either in support of the protests or to shield themselves from being viewed as antagonistic or crossing the picket line, uh, uh, if you will. In response to this total disruption of the country and to business as usual, the political elite primarily, in addition to the state violence they deployed, adopted a policy of disappearing. It was actually quite remarkable. In a country where most uh, television stations uh, uh, are owned by one political faction or another and regularly feature the politicians of these political factions, there were days and weeks where no politicians were seen on air. And in fact, it was that disappearance that kind of forced many of these uh, political party affiliated media outlets to give more space to the actual protesters because it would have been absolutely ridiculous to neither feature their own political patrons, but also not show the protesters. But this was part of an overall strategy of trying to withdraw from the scene and allow uh, various divisions and uh, dilemmas within the protest movement to perhaps undermine it. Um, and I think uh, uh, this was largely a failed strategy on the part of the political elite if it wasn't for the multiple crises that were actually being intensified during the uprising and not necessarily because of the uprising. In fact, what many of the politicians today in Lebanon would point to is they would say that the fiscal crisis, the financial crisis, the infrastructure crisis started on October 17th. They are trying to rewrite the chronology, rewrite the time frame uh, with regards to that. I think we should be very critical of that revisionist uh, uh, history, which is being put to political use. But I think we should acknowledge the fact that the weight of these multiple crises in combination with the state violence and the complete withdrawal of the political elite from the scene, at some point uh, uh, facilitated the dwindling numbers of participants in the uprising such that by I think January and, and mainly in February, we saw a move away from these mass uh, mobilizations of occupying numerous public spaces in Beirut or other parts of the country and more focused, targeted, and if you want to use the word militant, uh, direct action against particular institutions and spaces. And here I think of the central bank, uh, BDL, uh, where many street battles took place between protesters and security forces at the initiative of the security forces. I think of the attempt to storm the parliament. I think the attempt to occupy uh, the electricity company buildings, whether in Beirut or elsewhere. Uh, I think of the protests in front of the Association of Banks in Lebanon. Uh, we saw a real shift in strategy, in part in response to the complete disappearance of the political class, uh, but in part in response to the violence of the state against protesters and the desire to turn this uprising from simply a question of being on the street and occupying space to attempting to reclaim what we could call the pillars of the political system and the pillars of the economy. And I think that is why we saw an intense struggle by protesters to try and claim space in the parliament, uh, in front of the central bank and some of the other uh, uh, state-controlled uh, uh, political and economic institutions. There was an attempt uh, in early March 
to resuscitate the mass mobilizations that we had seen in October, November, December, and parts of January. And most groups were coalescing around March 8th, 2020, International Women's Day, which I think also speaks to the very important role that uh, individual women played uh, in the uprising, but also the feminist organizations and feminist activists and LGBTQ activists as well and organizations. However, by March 8th, you had the COVID-19 pandemic emerging, uh, not just in Lebanon, but around the region and around the world. And there was a decision by many of the groups that had called for a mass mobilization on March 8th to actually cancel or limit their own participation because they did not want to take responsibility for creating a type of gathering that might cause the pandemic to intensify in Lebanon. And this, I think, is a good juncture to think about the transition from what we could call the uprising period uh, to the uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic period. And with that, I will move to the third part of my presentation, where I'll try to give you a summary of where things are with the COVID-19 pandemic in Lebanon, but then zoom out to think about the intersections between this pandemic, the government's response, and uh, its relationship to the broader crises. For those of you that might not be familiar, although I suspect, uh, given that a number of audience members are either from Lebanon while they're participating in this presentation or follow Lebanon closely, uh, February 21st, 2020 was when we had the first official reported case of COVID-19 in Lebanon. Uh, there was a rapid uh, uh, escalation of cases uh, and responses by the government uh, uh, to that first official case. So if February 21st was the first official case, by February 29th, the schools were closed, which was at the time seen as a very controversial decision. Uh, some of the university and private school leaderships opposed that decision. Um, by March 6th, you had the closure of gyms, cinemas, and uh, nightclubs by March 11th. Uh, so a mere 20 days from the first case, you had the closure of restaurants and cafes. And then on March 15th, you had the official declaration of a medical emergency or uh, a, a state of mobilization as the translation goes. Now we are currently still in the official state of medical emergency slash uh, um, uh, uh, mobilization. Uh, this has involved the closure of uh, the land border with Syria, the closure of the airport to commercial uh, flights, with the exception of Lebanese who are being repatriated by the Lebanese government, and to my surprise, private chartered jets are still able to land and take off from Beirut airport, something we could talk about later on. Um, there's been a curfew imposed where um, cars are no longer allowed to technically be on the road after a certain point. I believe it's 7 p.m. at the time it was imposed. Today in Lebanon on uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, Technically, only odd numbered license plates, uh, vehicles are allowed to be on the road. And then Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, even numbered license plates with Sunday being a co common day. Of course, there are exceptions made for people who are um, workers in the healthcare industry or in government. Um, for a long time, uh, as businesses were closed, uh, delivery services were permitted. Uh, but no gatherings in public space. So things like the pine forest, things like the Corniche in Lebanon were closed. So I think um, it's really important to realize that this was a very severe lockdown for a lot of people in Lebanon. Uh, and only in May, on May 4th did we start to see a gradual opening up. So technically, uh, today, restaurants and cafes are allowed to open but only uh, with a limited capacity. I believe the rule is technically 30% of their capacity with the need to provide certain space between tables. Um, the uh, 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 riding on public transport requires the use of a mask uh, and uh, like this one right here. And uh, as of Friday, apparently, 
the government has mandated that pedestrians will be required to also wear masks or face a fine of 50,000 Lebanese liras, which uh, previously was uh, about $33.33, and today is about $12, which is quite the hefty fine. Uh, overall, there have been 1,161 confirmed COVID-19 cases, according to the Ministry of Public Health. Uh, of those 1,161 cases, 26 have resulted in deaths. Testing capacity in Lebanon today is approximately uh, between 1,800 and 2,400 tests per day. And according to the government, over 75,000 total tests were uh, um, administered uh, as of today. Now, I want to just briefly pause here to talk about how these statistics have overall been represented as being a success case. In fact, I think there was a Washington Post article that basically said, my oh my, despite all the dysfunctionality of Lebanon, look at how the government has been able to respond to the COVID-19 situation. I think the only thing the government has done properly with regards to the COVID-19 situation is to actually shut down the country. But uh, uh, I think it's also important to recognize that there has been a massive social dislocation that has accompanied this shutdown. Um, obviously, this dislocation is part of the broader set of crises, but to force businesses to close down without any kind of social safety nets to most of the employees and most of the businesses has been devastating, according to a local journalist. Um, I think the statistic right now is that 25,000 workers in the service industry, meaning hotels, restaurants, bars, have lost their jobs since October. Over 800 establishments have shut down. We're not clear if all of these have shut down permanently or only temporarily. There has been no rent relief uh, during this shutdown. There has been no mortgage relief during the shutdown. And in fact, the government has only promised uh, uh, to disperse 400,000 liras to the poorest families uh, around the country. But there is some great controversy over what these families are and, and who they are. And of course, we are not even talking about the over 1 million uh, people that live in Lebanon as refugees or migrant workers and migrant domestic workers for which there is absolutely dismal coverage of in terms of what their experience has been like, uh, let alone the inavailability of proper social safety nets. So I think what we've seen actually is that the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated existing crises, even though I think the government is increasingly shifting to try and blame current dynamics on the COVID-19 pandemic and its ramifications. Not very different, I would have to say, as a university professor to what many universities in the United States and institutions around the world are trying to do, simply blame the COVID-19 stresses as the original source of the crises they are currently experiencing, as opposed to institutions that were already in crisis and for which the pandemic had basically tipped the scale against. But in addition to critiquing this success story with regards to Lebanon and the story of the pandemic, I would like to posit that the reason the government was so quick to shut down the entire country in approximately almost exactly three weeks from the first official case was that it actually proved to be the most effective way to clear protesters out of the street because being on the street was the most effective tactic that these protesters have had. So instead of protesters shutting down the country, in very select and strategic and voluntary ways, you had the government shut down the country to prevent the spread of the pandemic, surely. But it's hard to believe, given how slow uh, other governments have responded, given their own political calculations. In this case, the political calculations encouraged a much more rapid shutdown in Lebanon. And in fact, the state of medical emergency or the state of mobilization that was declared by the government has allowed the government to prosecute uh, protesters that have attempted to meet, to plan demonstrations. It has allowed the government to uh, prosecute under a new set of laws, under a new set of violations of civil rights, uh, uh, protesters that gather to demonstrate 
against certain institutions. And so I think what we have today is a, a dilemma on the part of many of the activists and protesters who are trying to think strategically about how to reclaim the streets, how to re-energize the protest tactics, or maybe uh, um, re-strategize what protest tactics should look like in the age of COVID. And, and by doing so, it's not simply to avoid the heavy hand of the Lebanese government, which has been there since day one prior to the pandemic, but in fact, reflecting what happened on March 8th to try and be responsible about how do you wage a public protest campaign in the context of a pandemic like COVID-19. Now, uh, I, I will say that uh, it's also important to recognize that the COVID-19 pandemic has not only allowed the government, but has also allowed some of the major political parties to attempt to re-emerge after disappearing completely for the most part and reassert themselves locally in certain regions and with certain constituencies through claiming to provide aid, through claiming to provide various uh, uh, sanitizing services, although it's not clear to me what a truck going through a neighborhood spraying chlorine and water everywhere is actually doing to stop the pandemic, but uh, power perceived perhaps as power achieved. But I think it's important to recognize that with regards to the government's response, we are also starting to see these different political groups try to reclaim the positionality that they had completely disrupted. And protesters are taking stock of that. And I think that is part of why they are trying to be very strategic in thinking about how to reclaim the streets. And in fact, I would say that the last week has featured a rejuvenation of protests around the country, as was the case in the storming of the electricity building, the national security, uh, sorry, uh, the social security building, uh, uh, the banks once again, and a number of other state institutions. Um, I think I'm going to stop there because I think what I've tried to do so far is provide you with a kind of snapshot of the broader context, the protest movement that emerged and how both have intersected with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, unfortunately, and I always make this joke to Hisham and other people, I'm a historian, so I really defer to the uh, looking into a crystal ball and predicting what's gonna happen in the future to the political scientists who I don't think have done a great job at that uh, uh, so far, uh, uh, but have done a great job of, of, uh, on many other levels. And I look forward to your questions and comments, and I would be more than welcome to dig deeper into anything that I've described today, uh, or dig deeper into anything that I have not addressed. I wanted to keep it short, food for thought, stimulate a conversation or questions. I also wanna encourage you all for those of you that are interested in following uh, events in Lebanon, uh, it actually has a very robust uh, English language media landscape, uh, uh, some exclusively in English, but some that publish in Arabic as well as English. So I would uh, 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 definitely recommend uh, that you seek out uh, the local journalists on Twitter, um, and uh, uh, via their various publications. I would recommend the Lebanese Politics Podcast, uh, the Lebanese Center for Policy Studies, uh, uh, Taymour Azhari, who was with the Daily Star and is now with Al Jazeera, uh, Habib Batah, who is uh, uh, run Beirut Report, uh, the Public Source, uh, which is one of the new uh, uh, media outlets that has emerged. It's actually called The Public Source. I'm not telling you to look for a public source. Um, and uh, of course, Megaphone is another source. Uh, the list could go on, but uh, I think I have been very fortunate to be working and studying um, uh, a country that has such a vibrant, not just protest movement and activist scene, but uh, a media scene in Arabic uh, and in English. And um, for anything good I've said, I would like to credit the many people in Lebanon that have, have, uh, have, have proved very valuable in helping inform my opinions and my analysis, but I take full responsibility for anything they disagree with or, or anything wrong I've said. So I'll stop there and, and turn it back to, to Larry and Hisham.